Hi kids, it's Miss Jenna, resident artist at Mount Lebanon Public Library, and I'm here to give you some art activities and sensory activities for ages two to five, all inspired by the summer reading theme of Imagine Your Story. Our first activity is the bubbling brew, and that is inspired by Grunt, my studio assistant. And there are just a few really um, base level ingredients for this activity. You need a bin. This is just an oil drain pan that I bought at the Dollar General for a dollar. Um, I like the circular pan because it mimics the cauldron really well. You need vinegar, baking soda, and then some glasses. I like clear glasses so you can see what you're working with. You need some food dye or you can use liquid watercolor. And then you need pipettes. Pipettes or eyedroppers. Um, you could also use a turkey baster if you don't have any of these at home. But I definitely recommend at the very least using small spoons so that you can really do lots of color mixing and it doesn't get too oversaturated. So first what you wanna do is get your baking soda. And I'm just gonna get rid of the scooper because I want to fill my entire pan with the baking soda. So this is obviously something you can have set up beforehand. And then I'm just going to kind of move it around so that it's pretty level on the bottom. Now these glasses are already completely filled with my white distilled vinegar. And then I just put a few drops each of the uh, food dye and I chose to use sort of the more brightly colored ones that are the secondary colors because I want it to look kind of like a solar system or a universe inside of my pan. So to use the pipette, you want to squeeze, put it into your liquid and let go. And then you're just going to drop it on your pan. So if you listen carefully, you can hear the bubbling, the reaction from the vinegar and the baking soda. This is a really fun activity that you can do with members of your household. My sons, ages four and six, did this together, and they really got into the Witches and the Warlock theme. The green! Get that green in there. Whoa. Mom, my tail is a tiny city. And we're creating lots of different potions that were for good purposes and bad purposes. And I really like to drop the colors next to each other because you can start to see them kind of reacting and mixing together. My sons, of course, like to put them right on top of each other. And if you look closely after the reaction has passed, we have these, these deep cavities that are forming where all the bubbles took away the air. And it's really fun whenever the entire pan is filled to see all of the colors and all of the reactions. This is kind of reminding me of a flower here. And when the little fingers are starting to get tired and they're getting um, interested in really getting into um, the potion, then of course you can start to mix them up with the pipettes, maybe create a river and see how the liquids will react to that. See if they can flow. And whenever you have your entire pan um, all filled up with color, then what you can also try to do is to create a print. So if you were to put your paper down and kind of press, and we'll see, when you let the color sit for a while, it will start to really kind of get deep into the baking soda. And when you pull it off, then you have your print. And whenever this dries, the baking soda, you can kind of rub off, and then you have these really interesting patterns left behind. Our next sensory activity is color concoctions. Now this activity really couldn't be any easier. We are using materials that really anyone can have at home. Um, there are a lot of differences, a lot of different things that you can come up with on your own, and it doesn't have to look the same at all. There are a few elements that are pretty important though. We have our 
glass jars. Now you can certainly use plastic, but with our communities not recycling glass anymore, I've really been holding on to them. I really like to change up all of the sizes and the shapes of the glasses and to remove the labels so that they're clear and so that the artist can really see what's happening inside of them. I have a tray and that really just minimizes the mess. Um, just really anything that has a little bit of a lip. Um, you could also use a plastic tablecloth or just take it outside so that you don't have to worry about it. This activity does not even include vinegar or baking soda, so there's really no reaction. Uh, it's just another, uh, just a way to kind of keep the mess down. I was always doing those exploding experiments with the baking soda and the vinegar, and then I realized that the thing that my sons and my students really enjoyed most was really just mixing the colors. Uh, and so that's what I decided to do for this age group in particular. So I have my three color options over here. I'm sticking with primary colors so that this, uh, your students and your children can really just be interested in creating their own color so there are really no secondary colors involved at all. I have my different jars that I have filled up about halfway or a little bit more just so again we're not worrying so much about the uh, water overflowing. And what I really ask is that everyone just uses the pipettes or the eyedroppers in addition to being really good for fine motor and make sure that we're adding just a little bit of the element at one time. And it's really fun to be able to see how the diluted water makes a lighter version of the pigment and that's something to really talk about. So if I have blue and then I add my yellow, then I can create a green and I can use my pipette to swirl it around. And then maybe in my next jar, I want to use red and really just get a lot of red in there. And then I add my blue next. And then I mix it around. What I also really love about this setup is that it looks like a scientist lab. So I usually talk about being mad scientists and what can we develop? Are we creating our own colors? Are we creating our own creatures? If these were potions, what would the potions do? Are we trying to make ourselves have longer eyelashes? Or are we turning frogs into princes? So there are a really limitless options for this. If you are creating this setup for more than one child, then I definitely suggest having two separate setups. Uh, I know that my four and six year old really fight over the material, so I make sure that I have common materials in the middle and I have the materials they don't have to share, like the jars, um, just over to the side for them. So it's not something that they have to worry about. And some children you'll see will really spend a really long time on just one of their potions and perfecting it. And it's really fun to see them mix all of the colors together. They exclaim that they created their very own brown. Maybe what I would do as well is I have two different greens. So what would I call this green? Is this a grunt green like my studio assistant? If it's not a grunt green, how can I turn it like a grunt green? Maybe it needs a little bit more yellow. Or if it's becoming too dark, then I might add some water to dilute it. In addition to the color mixing, I have all of these extra add-ins, which are really fun. It's also not required. So if you would rather not have the mess of these additional items, then there's no reason to include them. But I find them to be really fun. I have a jar of plastic animals and some creepy crawlers. I have a nice big centipede that I might want to throw into one of my jars. I have water beads, which are really fun. Now these will bounce all over the place, so it's something that I try to kind of contain to one area of my studio slash basement or outside. And when you, you start dumping these different items into your potions, then you can start talking about, is it going to float or is it going to sink? And have your kids do a hypothesis or guess beforehand. You can talk about water density. See, I have my clear potion still in my front. Maybe I add some of my plastic stars. I also have sequins and I have sparkles. Now sparkles are usually banned in most areas of my house, but for my experiments, I always make sure every time I go to the dollar store, I just pick up a pack because there's no way that your kids are going to 
be able to limit themselves on the glitter. So expect all of your glitter to be gone. Now when you get to the point of your kids wanting to um, pick up the jars and dump them into each other, I really try to hold that off as long as I possibly can so that um, it can engage them a little longer. And I'm not lying when I say that my kids will literally spend hours in this activity. And uh, around Halloween time, we have bouncy balls that have other eyeballs. We just put the kitchen sink at this. Uh, I also really love to use fresh flowers. We'll take this activity outside and throw in herbs and flowers and dirt and everything. So that's really fun. In this final sensory activity, we're going to transition right into our art making activity. So what we have are just standard coffee filters. I like these large bloom ones here. And what I'm going to do is fold it in half. Now I'm placing them on a dish that has a lip. And I'm also underneath the coffee filters are just a couple of layers of paper towels and this is going to help us absorb some of the liquid that we're going to be putting on top. Now, this is really another kind of color mixing activity and also looking a little bit about what water does to these materials. So what you can do is you can still use the custom colors that you created in our last sensory activity. So what I might do is kind of grab some of my greens, I'll grab some of the yellow and use my pipette and kind of just move it around. Now some kids will really be into the pipette and some might need a break from that. So what I have are my magic markers and you might want to decide on your coffee filters what theme you, want, you might want to use. So maybe one I'll use these sort of warmer colors. So I have a yellow and I have an orange. There's really no rhyme or reason as to where you have to put the color. I would suggest doing at least two colors. My youngest son probably put about 15 colors on one of his and the other one only wanted to do two. I don't have to worry about what type of line work. The marks don't have to touch each other. So this is really a foolproof type of activity. But again, I would suggest at least two colors per coffee filter. And you do want to kind of encourage your kids to put maybe as much color as they can on it. Um, the more white that you have, it's just going to become a little bit bare. It's the same color. Let's see. So I have some different color combinations here. Now what I will do is use my spray bottle and I'm going to spray on my filter until you can, if you look closely here, you can see that the water is starting to penetrate the paper and it's actually creating veining and the veins are now connecting to each other. So the water is desperately trying to find each other until the entire surface has become diluted. If you don't have a, a spray bottle, you could just use a wet paper towel and dab that. Once your filters are sprayed and you decide, oh my gosh, that's not vivid enough, I would really like to add some more color, there's no reason that you can't add some dots or some different color to the filter. Now you will want the filters to dry for a few hours. You could do this at nighttime and, could, and it could be the last activity and then they can wake up to it. Or in the case of my children who have zero patience, you can use a hair dryer and you can zap them just for a couple of minutes. You'll know that they're done whenever they are sort of crinkly um, and they have this real kind of stiff feeling to them. So fast forward to when your coffee filters are dry, you can see they have a distinct sound to them. What we're going to do is create flowers with them. So an activity that my sons and I really enjoy to do every summer is to join the Renaissance Festival. And so it kind of mixes our love of witches and knights and 
beautiful fairies all together. So I wanted to make a magic fairy crown out of our sensory experiments. So I really prefer this sort of like large carnation or peony shaped flower, but you can cut your flowers to be really any shape you want. This is really the simplest way. To make a real full bodied flower, I'm just going to put the two filters on top of each other. You can choose to do warm colors together or cool colors together or really anything. I'm going to fold them back in half and then I'm going to twist them starting at the end. And you have really like a, a pretty tight flower to start with. So you kind of have to twist it really well at the bottom and really fan the flower out. Now once you've secured it to the band, you can really play with it a lot more. Um, I'm kind of constantly playing around with mine, so it doesn't matter if it's a little bit tight and not exactly the way that you like it at the beginning. Then what you're going to do is you're going to get a stiff piece of paper. So what I mean by that would be a cardstock or it would be a poster board. You can also use a cereal box, which is a really nice material. You still want it to be pliable, but it has to be sturdy enough to be able to hold this. And I would say that you could use a hole punch to create the holes, but even as an educator of 15 years, I don't own one myself. So I used a Phillips head screwdriver to create my holes. So this is about one inch wide. And for little children, I wouldn't really make it any wider than that. And I just simply folded it in half and made myself four holes on each side and also a hole at the end that holds the yarn. So you can use yarn, you can use ribbon, you can even cut up an old t-shirt and use strips of cotton if you don't have any of those things at your disposal at home. So what I'm going to do is to start in the center. I'm going to use a masking tape. I would not use a clear um, scotch tape. I would use a masking tape or a duct tape. I even have aluminum wire tape that is used for duct work. It's one of my favorite art making materials. What I'm going to do is put the end through my hole. I'm going to pull it through to the other side. And this is definitely something that little hands are going to need help with. So this might be where the parents kind of step in and help their kids finish up their activity. So once it's secured on this side, then you can grab your next flower and turn it around and tape again. So once you are starting to fill your crown, with your flowers, you can very easily start to move the petals around. You can even do a little dot of hot glue if you want to totally cover up your band. Now I have my studio assistant who is modeling our finished crown. And so what you can tell, um, hopefully you can't see too much of the base of the crown looking at it directly, um, but if I were to take it off then you can see I used the aluminum foil tape on the inside and I covered up all of the individual uh, masking tape on this side. And then I also covered the outside with it, kind of imagining that it was a metal crown that was covered in flowers. Uh, this is really fun. It can fit on really any child size head. And what I really like about it is it's using materials that you generally have at home and that you don't need anything special. So this was a crown that was created a few days ago and it's really held up even with both of my boys wearing it around and hopefully it's something that I can have for the future to use um, for that Renaissance Festival. Hey guys, thanks for creating with me today. Make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you don't miss any of the art making activities that I have in store.